certainly a pleasure to be here, and I hope that you guys will be saying the same after my speech. Uh, the, the title of the presentation is Building the Smart Electricity Grid, and then there's a subtitle which I'll come to later. Uh, I'm a professor here at KTH, and my job is of course to be as narrow-minded as possible and focused on my particular topic. But I will for a short while expand my horizon to say that the Smart Electricity Grid is just a piece of the future energy system. I can admit that. But in my view, it's a really important piece, and that's really why I'll be telling you today why I think it's really important that we focus on how we can build this important part of our future energy society. The smart electricity grid, just to get you started off a bit, is some say it was invented by President Obama in 2008, just like Vice President Gore invented the internet 10 years earlier, but that's just mean talk. The smart electricity grid is basically the response from the electric sector to the requirements that our new energy systems are putting on us. To simplify, there's two. We want to use electricity from renewable sources to a larger extent than we have been today. And that's going to change how the electricity grid, the transportation of the electric energy, needs to be done. And at the other end of the system, we also will change the way we use electricity. Electricity is a magnificent form of energy, and the potential of, of increasing the efficiency in different processes is great if we use electricity instead, for instance, of carrying energy in forms of, of fossil fuel. So using electricity, and of course, its transportation is the prime example. Uh, the minus 12 there is the, really what the, what the future holds for smart electricity. It's a Department of Energy report that came out last year uh, that tells us that the, this is then to be very specific, the savings in carbon dioxide emissions from the US electricity sector. And this is not the reductions, obvious reductions that would happen if we turn to wind and solar instead of, of coal and other fossil forms, but it's the reductions that we can get through more efficient transportation and more efficient use of electricity as, a, as an energy form. So that 12% is something that the, the power system, the power engineers themselves can do uh, without the necessary uh, changes, of course, in generation. And that's, a good, of course, a good thing. Then there's some prerequisites and, and stuff that needs to happen as well. But just looking at that, merely at the transportation, we can make savings uh, uh, for if we start turning more to the electricity grid. Uh, that's why it's important to build it. That's as much as I'm going to say about it. No doubt people will try to build this because there is gains to be had. Here is proof that someone is building it. This is a press release. And press releases, they, of course, they want to tell the truth to the world that something great is happening. This particular one, many of you may have seen me talk about it before, so I'll perhaps not keep you in suspense too long. It's about a big IT company, apparently uh, listed on the Nasdaq exchange, when that was about, and then uh, one of the largest entity companies in Europe. It's going to use some sort of IT technology to do all sorts of... Is there a pointer on that one? Uh, smart building services throughout Sweden. These services will help people remotely monitor refrigerators, ovens, and electricity, and, and do all sorts of fancy things to help us gain, or to help us work towards that 12% reduction in, in carbon dioxide footprint. And that the, in a few years' time, there's going to be millions of people using it. A big problem with the press release is that it's from 1998. So this is, this is 13 years ago. And, uh, of course, I mean, I'm not making fun of the people that wrote this. Well, I am, but they're not around, so... <laughs> uh, but the, the point is that I'm making fun a bit of our way of building the future. Because this is the way we build the future. Ta-da! Here's the grand solution. Let's roll it out. But that didn't really happen in 1998, and I'm sure that we don't want it to be the same thing again now in 2011, that we uh, don't sort of fulfill our promises. And why didn't we do it at that time, and what should we be doing differently in the future? Well, then I'm stealing some from someone else as well. Uh, there's uh, 15 years ago, there was a book out by Eric Schwartz uh, on the cathedral and the bazaar. There was a metaphor for how we should be building software systems in the future. Uh, the cathedral way of building things is that you have a large organization that manages the symmetry and the construction of the grand cathedral. Uh, we have guys that chop the stones to make the marble statues, and we have guys that carry it up the ladders, and then there is a manager, a higher-level manager, a director, a vice president, a president, and a chief executive, to make sure that everyone's working in time and keeping track of all the details. 
The bizarre way of getting things done is less coherent, you must admit. But it seems to be working just as well. You can go to a bazaar, you can find whatever you want, and you get it done, and you, you find the pieces you need. But there's little coherence. Nobody really knows who's in charge. And being in charge is, of course, really important. Knowing who's in charge is very important when you're building something important, like the future. And I think that this cathedral building, uh, many industries or have, I guess, progressed a bit from the cathedral building, perhaps the software industry to some extent, you know, the proliferation of open source and so on, that we can quite easily build our own uh, programs. Uh, one industry that may not perhaps have left the cathedral business is, I would say, partly the energy uh, industry. And I think that that is where we really need to, to look at how we change the way we build the future energy system, not hoping that there's going to be someone in charge to build the cathedral for us, but rather that we must look at it in more of a form that it's a less uh, structured uh, path forward. I'm going to give another example on that same topic, and this is where I come to my subheading of the presentation, the irrational infrastructures. The rational way of building a thing may be the cathedral. We have a grand project, let's pick a manager that can pick a few managers and sub-managers and so on, and then we pick the crew that builds it all. Uh, but that another way of, of building the future is just letting people do it, going about their normal lives, doing as they do, because it's very difficult to change people's behavior overnight. These two images, uh, th this is a set of refrigerators, and this one is a terminal with a Cisco logo on it, not pointing fingers to Cisco again, but I think it's a good example. This particular terminal from Cisco is some sort of energy monitoring device that uh, I can buy and I can put it in my home and it will help me monitor the price of electricity and thereby, of course, help me reduce my usage or shift my usage in time or, or other good things that the system can help me do or that society perhaps wants me to do or I might want to do myself. Here's another device, uh, a refrigerator. Here's a refrigerator with a water bottle thing in it, and here's one with an ice machine, and here's one without that. I, I, these are consumer devices, both of them, in, to some extent. I, when I go about making my choices for my little piece of the future, uh, I tend to fall for marketing. I tend to think, oh, that was a cool TV ad. That's a device I want to have because my neighbor doesn't have it yet. So I'll be the first one having that one. And uh, there's a brand that I, I really support. I, I believe in the, the, the folks behind this brand. They really want to improve the world. So if I go buy their stuff, uh, well, perhaps that's, that, that's my way of helping. Uh, if you know specifically about refrigerators, at least in Europe, there's this uh, energy marking that you can get in a B or a C or a D or an A or whatever on the energy consumption of the refrigerator. A++ or something similar is the norm today. And part of the refrigerator manufacturer's marketing is, of course, that it uses energy in an intelligent way. It's part of the business logic for the refrigerator manufacturer, and it's part of my purchasing logic to go for the latest and the best brand of refrigerator or vacuum cleaner or heat pump or whatever energy-consuming device it is. It's, it's part of my normal consumption behavior. Buying a fancy terminal that can help me solve the problem is not part of my natural consumption behavior. And what is rational when I make these two choices. Me, as a small individual, I make a completely irrational choice to buy a refrigerator that has a built-in function that it only uses electricity when electricity is cheap. Oh, well, that's cool. My neighbor doesn't have that. And the guys that put the brand here, they, they say that this is something of the future. Or a heat pump that only uses electricity when electricity is cheap. That's something I want to buy. And then there's another guy that phones from the local utility and tells me, oh, we have a new device. You can buy this device from us, it's just 1500 and then uh, over a 10-year period, period of time, you will have saved that amount. Uh, and, and my reaction will be, uh, well, no, I don't think so. And uh, the irrationality in these two choices may, is a bit <coughs> twisted here. I mean, from a society perspective, it's of course very rational that we all are aware of our energy usage. So why not install boxes and devices to help us do that? From uh, another perspective, it's not very rational for me to buy, you know, go buy the newest fridge or the newest whatever just because it has a feature I don't even understand. But 
it makes sense if enough of us are as dumb as me to go do that. And then there is some sort of infrastructure that can take care of these decisions. A market-driven infrastructure, I would say. That's part of the business logic of these device manufacturers. On that note, then, you could ask, so what's that infrastructure, then? What's that future infrastructure that someone's going to put in place if it's not the local utility? Well, <clears throat> again, just looking back a bit, this is a, in a, in a, it's another way of saying uh, the cathedral and the bazaar, but it's just look, using two other images. Here's a hierarchical file structure thing. It looked like it was invented just about when they built this uh, site, perhaps in the 50s has that feel to it, that there's a top and that manages and so on. Here's a map of the internet that I just picked out of Google. Uh, the internet is quite apparently much more uh, complicated than this hierarchical file system. And all of us have experiences with internet, I'm sure, and you know that you can find almost anything. And you stumble on new things every day, and people find you through the internet. And, well, maybe I don't have to state the obvious. Two things, though, that may be a bigger concern here, than here would be interoperability. That we can make sure that my new refrigerator can talk to the power exchange, perhaps, to get the latest prices for electricity. It doesn't have to go through the meter or anything, it's just a matter of hooking my refrigerator up to the, to the internet and downloading electricity prices. The, the refrigerator itself can turn itself on or off whenever it needs. That, that, that is capable to do without the utility meter. Uh, and that's interoperability, of course that we need to be able to connect things. But that connection cannot depend on me having to hire an electrician or a programmer to go install my new refrigerator. That won't do. So interoperability and plug and play is, plug and play is really definitely one part of the future technology. And the other obvious technology, perhaps easiest to remember if you think about the bazaar, is trust. Who can you trust? Because once you bought that fancy bag and bring it home, you realize it was just a fake. So that's the thing, of course, when we are less authority uh, dependent. It's perhaps a scary concept for a Swedish audience. Uh, but still, if we do admit that we're all equal, which is a good concept from a Swedish perspective, we need to make sure that we can trust the ones that we have our different uh, uh, interactions with. Whether it is, is the electricity price that's being fed to my device the correct one? Or is someone sort of feeding the wrong price to me to make my device operate off, uh, off my preferred uh, if, um, time schedule, if you like? So trust and interoperability, those are really, I think, the challenges for definitely the smart electricity grid, so that we can make sure that we can utilize the power of the bazaar rather than the hierarchical form of the cathedral going forward to build the, build the energy system. I think that just to very briefly at the end dip down to a technology issue just to so, show that, that I'm not completely up in the air, uh, looking again specifically at how information can reach me, it's very easy to think I would at least have been thinking so for quite some time, that there needs to be some sort of device that feeds this information to me or to my, device, to, to my appliances or my car or whatever. But that infrastructure perspective that the device needs to, to help me do this is perhaps because of my Swedish heritage or it's because of a mentality of hierarchy that the energy system or the electricity system is a big machine. Do not touch it, do not break it. So it has to be organized in this way. But looking at it, all my other devices at home, they're perfectly safe, uh, safe self-supporting. They can get all the information they need if they just have a connection. They can do all their own decisions about whether it's rational or not to be on or off. If this was a heat pump and not a refrigerator, there is, I would gather, uh, guess that it's really easy to come up with a business case even that uses electricity price and consumption pattern and then can tune your heat pump to heat your house using electricity only at the most opportune uh, moments. The savings I may get, well, well, perhaps I'll save it in five years. No matter really, because I'm going to be irrational in my choice. Just look at the advertisements for heat pumps these days. They seem to be selling you a flat screen TV thing that you're supposed to have in the living room to tell you all about the heat pump. 
So they're really in search for new gadgets, new features to add in their devices so that I will make irrational choices about their particular product. And that is the power that we must be using uh, when we build the future energy system. Thank you.